I think in this moment, um, my job is to convene, listen, um, activate, imagine, propose, uh, procure, provoke, <laughs> push, right? All the things that a really qualified virtuoso arts administrator would do. <laughs> Welcome to Arts Engines. I am your host, Aaron Dworkin, and today's guest with us is Daniel Bernard Rumain. Daniel, welcome to the show. Aaron, thank you for having me so much. What a pleasure to be here. So I always, uh, you know, at, tell our, our viewers that they can just, you know, check out the bios of all of our guests because they're extraordinary. Um, but to suffice it to say, it's a little more interesting with you because you do so many things. So I want to at least just share with our audience, you're a composer, you're a performer, you're an educator, you are certainly an activist, I would say social music artistic activist. Uh, you're a professor and professor of practice at Arizona State University. Um, and there is a lot for us to talk about that is obviously very relevant to what's going on today. But I wanted to just start out by uh, asking, can you kind of share with our audience, how could they in, you know, 60 seconds understand, like, what do you do, right? A lot of my guests have portfolio lives. They do a number of things, but they might lead an organization and maybe teach a little on the side. Pretty easy to just convey. You do a lot. How would you convey what it is that you do on a regular basis uh, in 60 seconds? Okay, that's a great exercise. Well, I would say um, self-definition is a type of equity. I'm a black Haitian American composer, violinist, educator, learner, social entrepreneur, activist, and father. I farm and frame ideas. I consider myself a citizen of the world. I run DBR Music Productions and I'm a small business owner and homeowner. And I'm very purposeful about how words have power and what we say reflects who we are. Awesome. And that's why I wanted you to do that instead of me, because uh, <laughs> you really nailed it. Uh, to delve into just one of those things, you kind of talked about, I loved it, farming and framing ideas. So, and I know uh, about DBR Lab, but could you kind of just share with us, what, when you say that, what do you mean and what are you doing uh, at Arizona that is farming and framing ideas? Really appreciate that, Aaron. So yes, as you mentioned, I'm a proud institute professor and professor of practice at uh, Arizona State University's Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts. And um, it's a dual appointment, and I run uh, something called DBR Lab, and the class that's fixed to it is DBR Lab Space. And it's a project-based uh, class, and my work there is in many ways project-based, actually, in that um, I'm designing classes, I'm hosting and convening an array of different um, 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 experiences for both faculties, for faculty, staff, and students. Mm -hmm. And by farming and framing ideas, that means that I'm really interested in how an idea I might have might germinate into something larger, depending on the collaboration and the conversation. For example, in DBR lab space, we don't use the word teacher, we don't use the word student we refer to one another as contributors, that we're all contributing to a classroom in a world of ideas. And I think that, you know, at a time where there's a drought of ideas, and in some ways a drought of courage, um, I'm, I'm always trying to lead by example. And I think that um, crediting and ownership are just one example of how we have to create a field for inquiry. You know, a space where particularly at this time, black men and people of color and students of color can feel safe, wanted, and validated. So how do you, you know, there's a lot of artists right now that feel passionately, artists of color and, and, and white artists or other artists who, who yeah. don't necessarily reflect the, the cultural background of, of, of those who are directly, you know, being oppressed in this moment, um, they 
oftentimes it seems they care deeply about what's going on, but they feel frustrated. So what can I do, right? Okay, yes, I can absolutely hit the streets. I can protest. I can do these things. But what can I do? What can I do with my art hmm. to make a difference? I hear a lot of people frustrated that I can't make a difference. These systemic things are too big. I'm just an artist. What do you say to them? Well, it's a question of scale. And scale is something that's very intimate and personal. So let's let's examine that quickly and you know, with a with a taking our Pollyanna glasses off and you know, kind of being real for a minute. So the question of scale. Well, let's just talk about you know the people that are the pe the people that we know, the people that at this moment we may be sheltering in place with. You know, um, my son has his own network. He's ten years old. So anything I say to him, or some things that I say to him actually, um, he might say to his friends, and his friends might say it to his parents. And exponentially, now you're having an influence. Um, because we're sheltering in place, so much of our lives are here, what I call our frames, held captive. So we're posting. We're engaging in online activity. And you know, as we're well aware, uh, one post, one word can explode. You know, so I think that what we put online at this time is really important. The words and the phrases, the connections that we're making, in some ways the people that we're friending and unfriending, all of this matters, right? All of this is part of, um, in some ways, a new ecology for the arts. And, uh, you know, the third thing I would say is as we look to the future and, you know, moments of true systemic change, um, I'm excited to think about um, what are the new conversations and the new collaborations that we must have in this moment where I think in some ways we're past aspirational thought and we're moving now towards um, specific systemic changes, contracts, and dates. So for you, how can you share an example with us or what would be an example of a project you're involved in or working on that you feel will contribute to this social context, to how we are thinking to each other and talking to and with each other? Can you give us an example of how you're using your art to impact social change? Absolutely. And, you know, as we're talking about the world, I apologize. It feels, feels, sounds like the world is outside right now. <laughs> and, you know, so I apologize for that. I'll, I'll mute in between. Um, so I'm on a few boards. I'm on proudly serve for the Association of Performing Arts Professionals, APAP. I also serve on the board for the League of American Orchestras. So those are two, or two organizations that are actively engaged in um, change. And I would say specific systemic change. That's number one. So, um, for example, I was recently involved in an online forum, quickly convened, quickly convened by the League of American Orchestras, where we had over 400 participants talking about racism, and, in, and to be uh, more specific, anti-racism within our American orchestral culture. How do we address it? How do we talk about it? Of course, APAP is quickly going to be involved in a series of convenings, one called The Break Room, done in association with Zozo Arts, in which we're going to convene and talk about where we were, where we are, and where we hope to go. Um, and um, as you know, the Sphinx organization and many others are actively involved in a series of online convenings. And I would say, you know, in our individual lives, you know, it takes two people to convene. Um, think about uh, who is teaching your child. Think about who is the chief of your police, local police station, fire department. Think about who runs your local grocery stores. Um, think about who runs your local lawn care <laughs> and landscaping company. I mean, they all matter. And I like to enter um, into these convenings agendaless so that we only agree to meet. We don't even agree on what we're going to talk about. The promise is that once we get into a room together or a space together, um, we'll know what to say and the conversation will be honest. And the only requirement is that we'll end with something actionable. Yeah. Awesome. So what um, I want to switch gears just a little bit, actually, a, a little bit away from current events, because one of the things that I think makes you one of those extraordinary arts engines in our field 
is that you've created a, a, a brand, a persona that is very unique to you. Someone can be another director of a, or executive director, president of an orchestra or lead a presenting organization or even be another quartet. But there's only one DBR, right? And you created this. And what I'm curious about for our audience is can you share some of the actual pragmatic logistical things that you've done along the way that has enabled you to do that, to build what I love to refer to, you know, arts entrepreneurship, sustainability around your art making. You have built sustainability around your art making. How do you do that? Are there some pragmatic advice for those who are watching right now who want to do the same thing? They want to take what they're doing artistically, but, but build a brand and build sustainability around it, including an income to keep a roof over their heads. What would you share with them? Are there a few kind of key things that have made it possible for you? That's a really wonderful question. Let me try to be succinct and clear. Let's start with education. I think education is very important. Um, what you are learning right now and the totality of your education is something that's very personal. So there are many different avenues for your education. What you're learning in school is just one of them. Um, who you're learning from is important. You know, I pride myself um, when I'm in New York City and on my block. I kind of call them the, the guardians. There are these gentlemen, um, and as, you know, as we get back to things, who are always on my block, always hanging out. And they have a lot of knowledge. You know, I've had wonderful teachers at Vanderbilt University, University of Michigan, where we went um, uh, together, where we were classmates, and, um, and onward um, in, in, from me in New York City. But I think education is key. And um, when I was very young, my first music teacher told me, you know, everything you know is an asset. Everything you don't know might be a liability. So that's the wonderful thing about being an artist, that, you know, every film, every book, every movie, the worst things that happen to you in life have some knowledge, something for you to gain. And uh, I think it has to be really broad and kind of um, all-encompassing. Number two would be environment. You know, where are you? And what can, where, what, the place that you are has important truths that need to be um, ex, um, um, found and discovered, right? So this goes a little bit back to this notion of farming and framing ideas. It doesn't really matter where you are. There are lessons in the walls. There are lessons in the roof. There are lessons on your street and on your block. I think like a lot of people, you know, um, we're here and I'm learning new things about my neighborhood. I'm learning new things about my person, you know, my body. I'm learning new things about uh, my material effects. I'm learning new things about, um, um, you know, the, the things that I hadn't considered that were a part of who I am in terms of where I live and the people around me. So environment's really important. And the last thing, actually, I would think about advocacy. I know this is a little strange, but we get, we get um, caught up in our careers. You know, how can I forward myself? How can I have a relationship with a person or an organization that will help my, help my career? I am guilty of this. And I wish when I was younger, I was advocating for more people sooner. Um, you did that. You were very young, and you started an organization which at its core is about advocacy. That's a big scaled idea or a scalable idea that can come down to whether it's teaching, whether it's collaborating, performing with someone else, um, whatever, whatever it is. The notion of advocating for someone else early on in our careers is not, all, it's not only a moral right, but it, it, I, I have seen and I know and have experienced that it will lead to um, a greater common good. I, I can't remember the frames, the fra the the um, this, the uh, f the the um, saying. Um, how do you lift all boats? Hmm. Right. right. Uh, you know, the rising tide. Yep. The rising tide lifts all boats. It's so true. And I think that for what we call the emerging artists, advocacy should be a part of your um, career toolkit. Gotcha. Awesome. Awesome. So now as we're looking forward, on the one hand, we have all of the unknowns related to the virus and when we'll be, we'll be able to perform before a thousand people or more again. And in the same token, 
what's going to happen as it relates to civil unrest and 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 you know the um, injustice of a lot of systemic things in society. What is next for you in the arts? Um, you know, if if six months from now, as you look back, what will you have done that you will say, I spent these six months really well. I I accomplished this. Another wonderful question. Well, going back to what we were just talking about, I'm I'm educating myself. You know, yes, I am a black man. I am a black Haitian American composer. There are so many things that I do not know about myself, my culture, my race, my person, my history, my Haitian history specifically. Um, so this is a moment of pause and reflection. It is a moment of crisis. It is a moment of conflict. It is a moment of change. To put it succinctly, when our politicians and pundits fail us, artists have always led the way. How we lead is individual, but um, I think that we are in the second part of a three-part um, uh, a three-part three-part structure, a three-part timeline. Mm -hmm. Part one was um, we had a series of horrific events, including the events surrounding the murder of uh, George Floyd, which led to a series of aspirational, mournful, and immediate um, responses from individuals and organizations. And these um, aspirational and mournful postings center around an, what I call a declaration and affirmation of the love for black people. Right? In fact, I wrote a declaration and, and an affirmation of a love for black people and um, have posted it and has, it's being distributed widely, which is, which is fine. But every, you know, a lot of people, this, you, you've seen this, this kind of messaging. That was phase one. Phase two, now we're into actionable items, and I narrow all of that down to what I call specific systemic change. This is going to take time, weeks, perhaps months, where in the organizations that I'm involved in, and proudly at Arizona State University, we are looking very carefully at what we have done, and what, more importantly, what, we'll, what we will do. And what are the specific systemic changes that we are going to begin to examine in terms of curriculum, in terms of uh, student health, in terms of our relationship to our spaces and venues and communities. And I think a lot, I know, a lot of organizations are re-examining their commitments specifically to people of color, but more broadly to themselves and their, the, the, um, the liabilities and the loss and the harmful behavior of past practices as we look forward to best practices, new practices. Mm -hmm. um, and the third phrase, I think, the third phrase of, the third phase of this three-part um, timeline, I think will be, will be what I refer to as truth, reconciliation, and rehabilitation. It'll be actually the um, enabling and a, a kind of rapid response um, to these commitments that that are going to be made, and I think in a few weeks you're going to start to see these things also mounting. Uh, new contracts. This is what we are going to do as an individual. This is what we're going to do as an organization. This is what we're going to do, I hope, as a field. It's very exciting. There's a lot of promise, and I'm only talking, by the way, very narrowly about the arts field, right? I'm not talking about our larger uh, societies and countries and global culture, if you will, but I'm hopeful I'm hopeful that um, what we, call, you know, you and I are the same generation, what we call real change um, is coming. Change has come. Real change, capital R, is a coming. Yeah. And, you know, as with all of these different monikers that you bear, composer, performer, educator, et cetera, um, as you look at them, is there one that for you stands out that do you feel you're able to bring the most impact as a composer, as an educator, as a performer? Are you, are you able to, or is that just an unfair question? Um, what's your sense about what part of what you do bring, is able to bring the most impact 
to the community around you? It's a really great question. I would say before the pandemic, my artistic work had the greatest impact as a composer, as a violinist, as an, as an artist, as a performing artist specifically. Post-pandemic, or I, or I should say, sorry, during this pandemic, my work as an administrator, arts administrator, is having the most impact. Now, I, my creative practice, you know, our creative practices are broad. So within my arts administration practice is education, um, pure administration, such as serving on a board, writing, publishing of papers and works, such and so on and so, th so forth. But I think in this moment, um, my job is to convene, listen, um, activate, imagine, propose, uh, procure, provoke, <laughs> push, right? All the things that a really qualified virtuoso arts administrator would do. I think the best thing I can do is to be very clear in my messaging be very confident in the words and the things that I'm asking for, and to be committed to the relationships that I have and the relationships that I would like to have. Yeah. Well, Daniel Bernard Rumain, you are truly one of the great arts engines in our field. Thank you so much for taking your time to be with us here on the show. It's really appreciated. Well, thank you, Aaron. I just want to say thank you so much for this platform. Um, you're truly one of our great art leaders, iconic even. And I really um, appreciate all that you've done in, uh, in your leadership, in your, the totality of your creative practice, and um, how you are leading us through a very difficult time for so many. You are truly a beacon of light, and I appreciate what you've done and what you're doing. <laughs>